My name is Rob Wallace. It says Robert on the front cover, but please hey, call Rob. me Rob. Okay, Rob. Um, I am someone who cut my teeth down here on the Cape. I grew up, uh, spent my summers on Mashney Island. Um, my dad still lives there. Um, my siblings uh, take it over from Memorial Day to Labor Day and don't give him any space. <clears throat> my um, mother lives over at Brookside. Um, so I have a, a big connection to down here. So it was really a great opportunity for me to be able to come and speak to you today. Uh, I live in Watertown, but I, I grew up in Medfield. Um, my uh, days now are spent mostly up in Maine in a small town called Harpswell, um, which is just north of Portland, uh, where I uh, keep a boat, and that's where I spend a lot of my free time. Uh, I'm either mowing the lawn or, or out on the boat. This is a story for me that actually started in a library. Um, I'm 52 years old. In my early 20s, I was uh, freshly graduated from uh, Stonehill College. And I was working two jobs trying to pay off my school loans and car loans and, and pay for rent. So I didn't have a lot of free time, but I knew this story. Um, and I started doing research. But my research was limited to Saturdays, where I go to the Needham Public Library. And then we didn't have the speed that we have today because of the internet. So everything that I had to research was to go and ask somebody in the reference section of the library, can you go down to the basement and see if you can find this microfiche that I just found in a card catalog? And that might be a half hour, 45 minute process. And then I would load it into the machine and it might be the wrong article. And so I'd have to go back and start over. So on a typical Saturday, I might be at the library for six hours but I only would get 10 minutes of research done in actuality because I had to take notes. There was no you know, cell phone camera taking or any technology conveniences like that. Plus, I was chasing girls, and I was trying to figure out my career. And I said, you know what, I'm putting this aside. Uh, fast forward, I turned 50, and I'm like, wait, I, was, I wasn't even 25 when I started researching this, and now I'm 50 in the blink of an eye. And when I blink again, I'm going to be 75. And I'm just going to look at this and say, what an opportunity missed if I don't pursue this. And so I started doing the research again, except this time it was much easier. And it was because of libraries that it was much easier, because of the online access. I did a lot of research through the Boston Public Library, found a lot of archives. Um, I found a lot of research through the Commonwealth of Massachusetts um, at their state archives. Uh, I went out uh, down by the JFK Library, and the Commonwealth Museum is across the street. I read through 3,000 pages of court testimony to do research for this book. Um, this book is based on historical fiction. Um, people always ask me, they're like, well, what does that mean? Like, how much of it is historical and how much of it, you know, is really in novel form? I'd say that probably if I had to put a number on it, 85% of this book is factual. And I did it that way for a reason, because truth is stranger than fiction sometimes. And this story, the details in this story, I just knew when people started reading through it, they would do just what I did when I was researching it of, I can't believe that happened. I can't believe that that detail is true. So there's over 300 endnotes in this book. Here's the fictional part. I knew that there were conversations that took place. I knew what the basic background of the conversation was. I did take kind of poetic liberty on you know, trying to, to move the story along, try to take a lot of court testimony or five articles that it took to break down something complex about the case. And I tried to simplify it through conversation and character building. Um, and I tried to write the book instead of as historical. I tried to write it in novel form. And what I mean by that is I, I call it left to right. As the reader, you're going through the timeline at the exact same time that the characters are going through the timeline. A lot of historical books that I read and enjoy, um, they tend to, like, here's the premise, 
here's what happened. I'm going to take you through it. I'm going to tell you what happened in court. I'm going to tell you what happened to the people. Um, and then at the end, I'm going to kind of summarize it all. And they do a great job of being able to do that. I wanted this to read that someone was, geez, the, the chapter just ended, but I, I, I need to go on to the next one. I need to figure out what happened because now I've paused and there's kind of a cliffhanger here. So that was the approach that I took. Um, my background is um, for over 30 years I've been in media, uh, mostly in, in sports media, uh, doing live events, um, Olympics, Stanley Cup Finals, Super Bowls. Um, and so I've always had uh, an interest and an involvement in my professional career in writing. This is obviously very different. Um, but in some ways it's similar too because it was kind of writing to pictures and um, that's what I do in, write, in, in, in TV, I write to pictures. Um, and so I tried to really take the scenes and bring a richness to them so that you felt like that you were part of the environment um, back in 1934 when this takes place. Um, let me tell you what I won't talk about today uh, because there's so many different verticals of stories that are happening within, within this one book. Um, I'm not going to tell you about um, Norma Brighton. Um, she is the wife. Her married uh, last name was uh, Millen. And she was married to Mert Millen, who was the leader of the Mert, uh, Millen Faber gang. And uh, she was 19 years old when she got married to, to Mert. Um, and her story is, uh, she's in the book, and it's, she's a great part of the story, but her story is a little bit more complicated um, because there's questions that arise of how much did she know and how much was she a naive 19-year-old girl that didn't know the, the um, awful things that her husband, her brother-in-law, and their friend were doing. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the two citizens that in two separate robberies uh, were shot and killed in cold blood um, over a combined $200. Um, so innocent life lost. Uh, it's a story that's important to the book. Um, I'm not going to talk about the, the political advantage of taking control of a situation and the bureaucracy of, I helped you get out of a situation, so I think that I should be rewarded for my time and my effort to make this go away for you. Um, that's a theme in the book that is pretty important and startling. Um, and uh, two cab drivers that are on trial, and they're fighting for their life, and they have 10 witnesses against them that uh, say that they uh, killed two people. And um, there's a trial that goes on for three weeks while other crimes are being committed. And there, is there this link of were they part of this gang? Are they not part of this gang? Are they the ones apprehended and the gang is still going on without them? Are they innocent? Uh, these are things that kind of connect it today too because there's this whole thing that goes into capital punishment because in Massachusetts in 1934 capital punishment w was a thing. Um, and then one of the criminals, uh, Abe Faber, he went to MIT. He was a graduate and he was brilliant. He was in the aeronautics uh, engineering school, which was new back in 1934. And it was new because of the popularity was because of Lindbergh and his famous flights. And he got into the program and it was not an easy program. But there was something that happened with inside of him that instead of pursuing becoming a contributor to society from a science perspective, he decided that he wanted to, um, to be a planner in a life of crime um, and to be an executor in a life of crime. So what am I going to talk to you about? Well, the first thing I'm going to do is take you back in time. And this is a story that all of you know. but. Um, this goes back to 1950, and this is about the Brinks holdup. And there's a reason that I'm kind of stopping here on our journey. Um, in 1950, the Boston police were a very organized uh, unit. They were well-trained. They put 
plans and tactics into place so that they could stop crime in Boston. They worked well, they were coordinated with the Massachusetts State Police. And in 1950, on January 17th, five to six, six to seven, even to this day, they don't really totally know how many men went in, but masked men um, in the north end of Boston, uh, where it meets the west end along the Charles, uh, they just walked right into the Brinks building. And there were cashiers counting cash, and there were guards, probably about six to eight that were on duty. And these masked men walked in at seven o'clock at night. And they held them at gunpoint, they tied them up, they gagged them, and they blindfolded them and made them sit, uh, lay on the floor. In 20 minutes, over two and a half million dollars was taken from that building and ev evaporated into thin air. 20 minutes. A couple minutes after they left, so just before 7.25 p.m. that night, the first guard uh, wrestled himself free and he hit the alarm to ADT, which simultaneously went off at police headquarters in, down in Boston. An APB going out over a teletype. 15 seconds later, seven minutes after the call came in, 12 minutes after the robbers left, there was an all points bulletin where every single Boston police officer that was on duty knew what their job was. They knew where their destination was. And what they had figured out was Boston was a city of bridges with only one road leading in and out that didn't go over a bridge at the time. And so their whole plan was, we can eliminate crime by turning Boston into an island and choke off traffic. And so that's the perimeter that they created around Boston. They, they turned it into an island. Newspaper reporters back in the day, they called it um, Operation uh, Rat Trap. So it was so well known what their tactics were that that's, the newspapers had a nickname for it. Um, Massachusetts State Police automatically would go into gear and they would create a 190 mile perimeter around Boston. And they would be at Cloverleaf um, uh, on ramps, off ramps. They would main intersections and, and main arteries of, of outside of Boston. They would cut them off and just pull over every car and inspect every car. This is a well-coordinated, thought-out plan by the, the police. It was so predictable that no one knew what happened at the Brinks. There was no trial for six years. The money had just evaporated, and if you know the story, you know to this day, it, I believe only $180,000 of it has ever really been fully recovered. The reason this is so important is at the time there was a Harvard psychology professor that said the problem with modern day police is that for 20 years, you haven't changed your tactics. You're predictable. You have an emergency and bandits know your response time. They know where you're coming from. They know at any particular part of the day how many cars are on the road. They know that you go to shut off the bridges. So there were all these things that were predictable. So why is that important? Now we go back to 1933 and 1934, which is where this book takes place. And it was the complete opposite. Law enforcement was in chaos. Um, it was what the, the bandits called open season on cops. They were more weaponized than the police. Um, they marched into any situation with an audacity of we're just gonna take what we want and no one can stop us. And it wasn't something that was um, particular to Boston. This was happening across the country. It was happening in New York. It was happening in Chicago. It was happening in the big cities. And this started back in Prohibition, right? So with, um, uh, with liquor being illegal, you had the Capones of the world. 
Well, now this is 1934, the beginning of 1934. Prohibition in December of 1933 uh, was lifted. The crime started to change. They were starting to target banks. They were starting to target payroll. Um, and uh, the police were still, you know, you moved from the Capones to the Dillingers. Uh, and the police were still trying to play catch up all the time and felt like they had a bullseye uh, on their back. In Boston, uh, Governor Joseph Eli wanted to change that. And there was a disorganization in communication. And so he wanted to increase the police force. There was only a couple hundred people that were um, members of the Massachusetts State Police at that point. There were 10,000 police officers in the state. He wanted to roll up the small cities and towns and the, the metropolitan cities and the state force under one umbrella. Otherwise, they were going to ha have to go and invest a lot of money into the recruitment to move forward with growing from 200 officers to whatever they felt like they needed to patrol the state. There was a lot of resistance. And the reason that there was resistance was because the police chiefs didn't like it. They felt like this was a Scotland Yard type of mentality, and they didn't want to police um, their local territories that way. They wanted to be in control. They knew their people. They knew their neighborhoods. They wanted to control their situation and not be told what to do, not to share resources. And so there was a lot of conflict. And so what the... Um, uh, what the governor did was he brought in a commissioner of public safety and said, we're going to write a bill called the Unification Bill to bring all this together. We're going to get, in 1934, we're going to get all the support we need so that the public gets behind us. Figure out how to do that. So the, the, uh, Daniel Needham, uh, who was the commissioner of public safety at the time, um, he was in charge, as a, he was a lawyer, um, and he was in charge of putting together the paperwork and the writing of the bill and also getting public support behind it. And so the first thing that he did was he decided that he was going to um, take the police communications van. It was a 1934 model. It was state-of-the-art technology. And they brought it to the Boston Auto Show in January of 1934. And the Boston Auto Show that year was very popular. It was popular in New York just a month earlier, and it was um, popular as packed every day uh, in January of 34 in Boston. And the reason for that uh, was because the old fleet of the 20s was dying, the economy was slowly starting to change, and they knew that they needed to get newer cars on the road, and people started to have the, the income to be able to afford it. So there were a lot of people that went to this auto show including Mert Millen, his brother Irv, and Abe Faber. They were in their early 20s, 24, 25 years old. And the reason that they went there uh, was because they were very interested in going to the exhibit that showed off uh, this new communications truck. But they weren't interested in the truck. They were interested in the flex that General Needham was putting forth, which in front of the truck, he had tables of displays of all of their arsenal. It was shotguns. It was riot guns. It was a Thompson submachine gun. Um, it was grenades. It was everything that they had that was used to deter crime in Massachusetts. That was the big flex. And guess what? It was a popular attraction. Women, children, men, everyone from all over wanted to see the power of this force. It was there for a week. This is at Mechanics Hall on Huntington Ave, if you're familiar with Boston. Uh, it was there for a week. And on a daily basis, the Millen brothers and Abe Faber were there from opening until close. And if they weren't listening to the police give an overview of this is how this gun works and this is why we have it and this is how you load the ammunition. Um, they were paying attention to the perimeter of the security of the place. 
and they were looking for a weakness. And it only took them a few days and they figured it out. And the weakness was pretty simple. The weakness was, at the end of the day, the police on that back door would take all of the ammunition, all the arsenal that they had on display, and put it in the back of the van. It was a handle door, and they just used a simple lock and key that went into that handle on the door. That was it. With a sledgehammer, all you had to do was let the sledgehammer drop and it would knock that door handle loose. And they knew that that was their way in. The other thing that they figured out was with all that firepower there overnight, they were certain that somebody was there to protect it, and there was, except it was two part-time security guards that were unarmed that had to walk around the entire square footage of the place at night with nothing more than a flashlight in each other's company. So they decided, guess what? We're going to go and take this gun because this gun is going to give us power to do tremendous things in this state and beyond. So on, April, uh, on January 27th, 1934, at about 1 a.m., through the shadows, the Millens and Faber snuck into Mechanics Hall. How did they do it? Because Mert, earlier that day, this was down in the basement. He saw a window that was up, you know, probably a little lower than that one above the door, and he just went and unlatched it. Nobody noticed. And that's how they snuck in. Didn't take them long to take control of the guards and to tape them up. And they walked out with riot guns and ammunition and grenades uh, and smoke grenades and a Thompson submachine gun. No one knew anything about them. They had never been photographed. They had never been arrested. So there was no fingerprint trace. There was no trail of them. They just disappeared. Has anyone ever been to Needham? So you, is anyone from Needham? Millis. Millis. OK, so you know Medfield. Um, this is 135 in Needham. If you drive down 135 today in Needham, this building is still there. It's a gorgeous building. Uh, now it's Needham Bank. And it's connected to the building that's over here. Uh, in 1934, it was the Needham Bank Trust. And a couple days after, um, oh, sorry, my head goes wild sometimes. Um, there was such audacity in the Miller Faber gang that the next day, the Thompson submachine gun wasn't enough. So they walked and marched right into during prime business hours, the Massachusetts State House, where on the second floor the Detective Bureau was. And they marched into the Detective Bureau with detectives and troopers all around. And they just took from under their nose other riot guns and other revolvers and other pistols. And no one saw them do it. <laughs> now, when I finished writing this book, I went to the Massachusetts State Police Museum and Learning Center. Wonderful people. I said, geez, I'd love to take a, a photo of my book with an old-fashioned typewriter and a Thompson submachine gun if you have it. And they said, oh, yeah, we have one. It's out of commission. We've put some cement in the barrel. It can't be fired ever again. We have one. And I said, great, great. Can I come by? I show up. <coughs> There was probably about six or seven retired troopers that gave tours at that museum. And they only needed two or three during a day. But because I was coming, for some reason, they thought I was a famous author. Um, and so what they, they knew I was coming. And so they all volunteered to be there that day. And it made me really nervous. Because everything I just explained to you, there's a big black eye here on the state police between you know, a, a lock mechanism that is fragile, and then from while they're on duty, weapons stolen from them. They did not look good. And now here's seven troopers welcoming me because I've written a book that is kind of about the Massachusetts State Police. And I said, I need to put a big pause on this because I can't have you find out later and be upset with me that you prevail 
but you don't start out so great in this story, and I told them why. And two of the troopers, retired troopers, looked at each other and they smiled and they're like, yeah, that sounds like something that we'd do. Like, that's pretty believable that we would make some type of mistake like that. And um, at that point I realized, okay, I'm with, I'm with good people here. They realize that they're human. Um, and so I ended up, I thought I was going to be ushered out of there in 10 minutes. They had me spend four hours there as they told me other stories. Wonderful people. Um, so this is back to Needham. So that was January 27th. Uh, this is Needham on February 2nd. Between that time, this is probably about January 30th or so, uh, a black Packard that had been stolen rolls into town. And what was happening was the um, robberies weren't just taking place in big cities anymore. They were targeting across the country smaller towns just like Needham that were on the fringe of the city. Why? Because maybe the police force wasn't as big. Um, the town definitely wouldn't be expecting it as much as a major city. And there was probably the same amount of cash from bank to bank. And so they chose Needham. No one really knows why, but they chose Needham. Um, they drove out from Roxbury. That's where they kept their um, stolen car in a rented garage. And they drove there, and they were casing the, the, the town. And the way that they did that was um, they didn't go and drive around on their own with a map and try to figure it out. They went to a real estate agent named Frank Hammett. And they went to his office and said, we're interested in renting a cottage. Do you have anything that's available? And Frank did have one house that was available. And um, he said, I can take you to it right now. And they said, well, what's the rush? Why don't we do a drive through town? I want to see what the community is like. And they leave his office and they, they drive up uh, Chestnut Street in Needham. And um, they see this building. It's a massive building, brand new. And they said, wow, what is, what is that building? And Frank says, oh, that's the um, public safety building. It was just built. Um, that's where the police and fire um, keep all of their equipment, and it's their headquarters. And they were like, wow, that's a really big building. How many people are on the police force? And he was like, well, I don't know. He goes, our budgets have been really short lately. You know, a lot of it went into building this building. There's probably 10 or 12 um, uh, detectives and police officers on duty, uh, but never all at the same time. That, that gets stretched across shifts. And they said, oh, interesting. So they take a left on a Great Plain Ave, which is now 135. And you can see that there's train tracks here underneath the snow. And before they get to the train tracks, they see the bank and they're like, wow, what is that? That's a beautiful building. What is it? And he said, well, that's the Needham Bank Trust Company. And they go over the railroad tracks and they kind of slow down a little bit. And you can see up here in the corner of the building, there's a bank alarm. You still see them in some old buildings today when you drive by. And they're like, oh, it has, I see it has an alarm. And, and Frank kind of chuckled and he said, well, geez, you know, we have one, but um, it's kind of like crying wolf because it goes off so much by accident. And not only that, when the train comes into town on a daily basis, the grocery store that's across the street and the food vendors that um, need uh, their nourishment that they're going to sell for the day, they want everything fresh because there's not a lot of refrigeration. So the train comes in and chokes off traffic and cuts the town in half. Now why he's telling them all this, nobody really knows. He's just trying to have a conversation with these guys who are otherwise quiet. And he said, and the train whistle, guess what? It sounds almost identical to the bank alarm. So sometimes when we hear the train whistle, or if we hear the bank alarm, we confuse it with the other, and so we just don't really pay attention to it. And so there's these mental notes kind of going off in the Millens and Faber. And they go to the house. There's no furniture in the house. They don't tour the house. The house is two floors, and they don't tour the house. They just stay in the kitchen, 
because there was a bottle of whiskey in the kitchen and a glass. And for some reason, they thought that they would just help themselves and had a couple of drinks with this guy, Frank, and said, okay, you know, we've seen enough. Never ask one question about the school system, nothing. They go back to Frank's office. They go back into the office. Their Packard is parked out front. Now, at the time, there's a police officer that's patrolling that area, and his name is Forbes McLeod. And he was a big man, big. He could fill out a door frame. And he loved in the winter being able to get warm by going into each of the businesses and gossiping a little bit, spreading his own, learning gossip, sharing it with others as he went from storefront to storefront. So it was time to visit Frank, his good buddy. And as the Millens and Faber were leaving, Forbes McLeod was walking in. So I imagine that they were, as they passed through the doorway together, they were almost nose to nose passing by each other. And Forbes McLeod got a good look at them. Forbes McLeod was known in town. One of the things he was very well known for was he had an incredible memory. He knew each person what car they drove, and he probably had a good idea of most of the numbers on their registration plate. He did not recognize these guys. The angle that he had when he went in the office after they left, he went and he looked through the window and he could see the partial make of a dark colored Packard out front and he could probably only see a few numbers that were on the plate. And his reaction to Frank was, that looks like a tough bunch because I don't like the look of those guys. And he tries to, he takes out his notebook and he tries to write down the registration numbers as quickly as possible, but he only gets a few of them. This was February 1st of 1934. The next morning, at 9.30 in the morning, that is when the train is scheduled every day during the week to come and choke off traffic, and the Millens had learned this. So they got to town a little before 9.30. Their goal, oh, if you care, the Red Sox are going to be on pretty soon. And just, just went away. <laughs> um, their goal was to beat that train. It was imperative to beat that train because if it choked off traffic, if they knew that the police station was on this side, they knew that they had a superior advantage and they knew their escape route. And so they beat the train. And as you can see, there's a 45 degree angle that these cars parked at. That was the parking situation in town at that point. There were no cars there in front when they pulled up. They pulled up parallel to the bank and that was noticeable. When the train came through and choked off, all the vendors came out and they started pulling off boxes of meat and produce and all sorts of things that were perishable. And they started wheeling it across the street to the AMP grocery. They started putting it in their vendor cart so that they could take it to corners where they would sell bananas. And the gang masked themselves, everyone but Mert Millen masked themselves. And they went into the bank and Mert was carrying the Thompson submachine gun. There were patrons inside, customers, and there were employees inside. And they went in and told everyone to stick them up, that it was a robbery. And the first thing that Mert Millen did when he went in, after they got control of the situation, was he walked to this corner window so that he had a position to see when the train was leaving. Forbes McLeod, this is his beat. He's on foot patrol. He had just finished a half hour before as a crossing guard, letting the kids into the school that was less than a mile down the road. Forbes could see between the cars, and he could see that there was a car that wasn't parked just right. And so he was looking, trying to get his best vantage point between the cars, and he was walking down each car, seeing if he could get a better look. And his heart must have sank when he saw a dark colored Packard 
No one knows if he could see the registration plates, but we do know that he saw the car. Now, he has this building churn inside of him because he knew from the day before that something no good was about to happen. And he had to wait for that train to get out of the way. That train lasts there about 15 minutes. That's how long they were in the bank. When the train started to move, the Millens and Faber were inside and Forbes McLeod is on this side of the train and I'd like to read you what happens next. Mert shouts, here comes a cop. Get him, let him have it. Mert stepped in front of the window and like a gangster from all the Saturday matinee movies he watched time and time again, he lifted the Chicago typewriter to his hip and pulled on the caulking handle. Outside, the train whistle blew long and loud, signaling it was about to depart from the Needham Center station. To quicken his response time, Officer McLeod began to slide his position down toward the caboose. He was impatient and breathless as he scurried along the gate yet to be raised by the gate tender, Frank Vila, who had just emerged from his shack next to the passenger platform. A gas-powered train could easily accelerate to over 200 miles per hour, but when the locomotive weighed 220 tons and was a, uh, pulling a full haul of freight, it could take a quarter mile or more of track to achieve anything that resembled speed. As the last cars groaned leaving the station, McLeod, an expert shot, thought about going for his weapon. Just the day before, he was awarded the gold badge for marksmanship. He couldn't be sure there was trouble on the other side, but he was trained to confront it. His weapon was holstered under a few layers of clothing. His department-issued outerwear was a heavy-weighted Melton wool pea coat. He'd have to unbutton several brass buttons on the double-breasted garment. Under that was his standard uniform jacket, which was pulled taut over his holster. McLeod could see Vila moving for the hinge gate, but he wasn't waiting any longer. The train had pulled out and the street was clear. He was no longer fast, but he was agile as he crouched under the wooden gate. He was alone in the middle of the street. As he stood upright, Officer McLeod moved for the buttons of his coat. It was a futile attempt. The pit 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 of rapid gunfire scattered all around him. Traveling at a velocity of more than 600 miles per hour, the 45 caliber bullets jumped up and bit him as if he had just stepped on a hive filled with angry bees. He was riddled with copper-toned Lubeloy uh, bullets, which uh, struck with such violence that his body was jerked around before dropping like a weighty sack of mortar. The fresh powdered snow turned from the pristine white to a river of crimson stain as blood and breath escaped the police officer's body. When Mert saw the cop exposed in the street, he slobbered. Even with Irv and Abe cheering him on from inside the bank, his finger was already hot on the trigger. The stolen Tommy gun cast all of Mert's hate out into the street and a fusillade of bullets piercing the soul and the spirit, the joints and the marrow of Officer McLeod. When the smoke cleared, all that remained was the pathetic reminder that Mert Millen was still a nobody, falling deeper into an eternal, fiery, bottomless chasm. Although he felt fulfilled, the stark reality of the moment was far from grim, uh, was far grimmer. By shooting a peace officer, he shifted from the shroud of anonymous thief into the hunted to the ends of the earth maniac, a nameless public enemy. So Forbes McLeod is bleeding out in the middle of the street and now they make their getaway. And what do they do? They take two and bank employees and a Packard in 1934 had runners on the outside doors. They made them stand on the outside of the car and hold on for dear life. One of the men, as the car pulled away, took a chance and rolled off the car and rolled behind another car. They fired a couple of shots at him. They missed. The bank manager, Mr. McIntosh, is on the driver's side and they start their escape. They drive through um, and take a left 
under what's called Mark Tree Road, which is about less than a quarter mile down the road. Then they take an immediate left onto Oak Street, and that puts them on a collision course with Glover Hospital. Now, if you remember, we stopped in 1950, and I talked about how organized the police force was in Boston and how that worked to their disadvantage. Well, this is the chaos that was law enforcement in the 1930s. The call that an officer was down immediately went back to the police station. And Chief Arthur Bliss was there at the front desk when the call came in. He's the chief of police, except outside, with, a, with the exception of his foot patrol officers out on the street, he was the only one in the station that could respond. Some would think that he would go to the scene of a crime as a holstered policeman trying to apprehend a criminal. But his job was also, he had to go and get the ambulance because an officer was down, and the chief of police had to drive the ambulance to the scene. During this time, um, Oak Street, the car goes down Oak Street and takes a hard left onto, um, in front of Glover Hospital on Chestnut Street. Across from Glover Hospital on Chestnut Street as well is the police station. So as the ambulance is pulling out, the getaway car is speeding through town. He could have stopped them if he had known. So that's just a glimpse of the chaos that started the disorganization because the police had too much to do. He was the ambulance driver and the chief of police that needed to organize a manhunt immediately. A call did go from dispatch. Um, there was no teletype in Needham. They had one, um, but it got cut months earlier for budgetary reasons. It cost $500 a month, which was definitely a lot of money in those days, uh, to keep the teletype online. So Selectman had taken the teletype out of commission. Chief Bliss was so adamant that they needed a teletype back in place that just the day before he got approval to bring it back online, and it was scheduled to go online later that afternoon. It sat in the corner, untouched, unwired, unusable, and so they had to call Newton police and Dedham police, you need to put this out over your teletype. So there was time that was lost. Again, in Boston, in 1950, 15 seconds for an APB to go out over a teletype. In Needham in 1934, they were waiting for it to be installed because of budgetary reasons. And so they lost time. They were able to get a phone call down to a firehouse that was in Needham Heights, which is down near 128. And um, a police officer um, by the last name of Haddock, Francis Haddock, he was there and he knew trouble was coming. He was more prepared than what Forbes ran into. And so he did unholster his weapon and stood out in the middle of the street, except he didn't know that he was against a Thompson submachine gun. And he got cut down on the line of duty in the middle of the street. A firefighter that was alongside of him that he had just been talking to was wounded. He was cut down. The gang leaves town. Everything goes back to, this is where the crime started. Um, and so everything comes back to, wh what are we going to find there? How quick is the response time going to be? Forbes died within the hour. Um, it took Officer Haddock another day, and then he passed. Two police officers were killed the first time a machine gun was used in a crime in the state of Massachusetts, and it was a machine gun that was stolen from police, and it killed police. So you have, back at the bank, you have Needham police that have just had the wind knocked out of them. They've had two police officers shot. They're still alive. They're fighting for their lives. This is the moments after the crime. They're fighting for their lives. 
their wind has been knocked out of them. Their feet have been taken out from under them. They don't know where to start because they want to be there for their fellow officers and do whatever they can. Blood transfusions are needed. They want to help. But they also know they need to start getting testimony from the bank, from the witnesses, and they need to start combing for um, fingerprints. Well, Needham Police decides, well, we don't get along with Boston State Police because we know what the governor's doing, so we're going to call Boston Police because we're more comfortable with them and we're going to have them come in and help. Well, the state police were not going to step aside and just let that happen. So you now have a convergence onto Needham of state police, of Boston police, of Needham police, and then surrounding towns coming in to help support. It was complete disorganization. State police, with the help of the um, uh, safety commissioner came in and said, this is our case. We, this is a bank robbery. This is our case. They could not work together. What happened was if state police or if Boston police apprehended a suspect and started to question him and realize, okay, we'll go check all that out. We don't have enough to keep you. We're going to let you go. Needham police or some other police department was picking up that same person an hour later and going through it again. So resources were being wasted because they weren't communicating with each other. Meanwhile, no one knows where these criminals have gone off to and no one knows with a Thompson submachine gun where they're going to strike again. It's called machine guns and typewriters because sometimes the press becomes crime solver. You have on the left, Joseph Deneen of the Boston Globe. On the right, I love this. Uh, it was an advertisement in the Boston Post. Um, that's Larry Goldberg. And there was such a contrast between their personalities. They were best friends. They were also competitors. They were probably two of the mightiest crime writers, crime reporters in Boston at the time. Globe and the Post. Um, where Larry was flashy. Joe was probably on two suits and shoes with holes in the bottom of them. Um, you know, uh, they were kind of polar opposites when it came to personality, but they got along and respected each other. They see what's happening with the police, and they decide that they have to get involved. They have to start pressing the investigation. They have to start turning up their own sources. They have to start leaning on people that are going to help them figure out how to solve this case. Make no mistake about it. In the end, the police solved this case. I always want to make sure that, that that's not confused. Police did their job. But during those early days, those early couple of weeks when they couldn't put things together when they couldn't dance the waltz together of cooperation. It was newspaper reporters that helped them get their best leads that put the state's biggest manhunt at the time back on track. Joe Deneen was actually a Needham resident and his four-year-old daughter um, Phyllis was playing in the front yard when um, the gangster car drove by with a human shield on the front, on the driver's side. And she called to her dad and said, Dad, he was in having breakfast. Dad, there's a man standing on a car. And he's like, well, that sounds a little ridiculous, Phyllis, but let's go investigate. And they went out, and of course, he didn't see anything. But because he was a crime reporter, he started to listen, and the hairs on the back of his neck raised. He could hear commotion at the hospital. He could hear commotion at the police station. He could hear commotion in the center of town. His house was right smack in the middle. The robbers drove a 360 in their getaway around his house. So he was right smack in the middle of all of it. And those early hours gave him his biggest advantage. That's where I'm going to stop. That's my favorite setup of the book. I think that there's so much that happens before it and after it. I think that there's a lot that happens with each character in their development. Um, I will share this with you just because I found it really interesting when I found it. Um, Joe Deneen was my great-grandfather, which is how I knew about this case. 
he also was one of the leading crime reporters uh, on the Brinks robbery. And he probably, in his writing, whether it be books or movie deals or newspaper articles, he probably made more money than each of the cut that the actual gangsters got from the two and a half million dollar robbery. Um, he became very famous nationally because of that. Um, oh, wrong way. The Packard was eventually burned and left in Norwood. And I came across this photo. It's at the Boston Public Library. And I came across this photo. The man with the hat on who's facing, that is Joseph Tanin. I stumbled upon that. And I, I got goosebumps when I saw it. That I, Here's an action shot of my great grandfather you know, doing his, his job. And I just found that really interesting. When the case was finally over, he wrote about it in 1935. And he said what I think kind of captures it best. The Millen's Faber case reads like fiction because when you do read it, you're like, there's no way that that's true. There's no way that that's true. There's no way that that's true. And then you go and you look in the end notes or you read further into the book and you realize, my goodness, this is true. That's it. Did the three go on and do more robberies with that machine gun? Um, so within two weeks, once the, feet, once the feet were under the police again, and they were able to cooperate and figure it out, um, it was the largest manhunt in state history. And so at that point, the, the reason that you see the car burned out was because they knew that they needed to start getting rid of evidence because they knew that they were on their tail. They knew that they needed to get out of the state. They knew that they needed to, they still wanted to do crime. They thought that they were going to have to take a pause from Massachusetts because the heat was on. Um, but they were determined not to let go of that Thompson submachine gun. They thought that that was their advantage.